Good evening and welcome to the third episode of The Focus, a new program that seeks to go beyond and highlight the issues and personalities behind the news. Now, the Patriotic Front government has embarked on several borrowing measures in order to increase capital for several projects, most of which have been termed as developmental and vital for citizenry. Among the activities endeavoured on include the issuance of sovereign bonds, such as the famous 700 million bond, which, ha which have been successfully subscribed. One area this bond has gone to includes the railway systems of Zambia and the recapitalization of several other defunct sectors. However, there's been growing concern from several stakeholders on the danger of leading the country into a debt trap that would take several laborious years of sacrifice for the country to be free. And meanwhile, the country's currency, the Kwacha, has in the past few weeks seen a steady drop against other major currencies. Today, trading against the US dollar at a price of 6.93 as a buying price and a selling price of 6.826 Kwacha. This has affected several sectors in the, in the country, with the most recent being the fuel and petroleum supply that has led to a hike in fuel prices. The focus therefore tonight is on whether the government has a clear strategy for the economic liberation of the country. Is the devaluation of the kwacha a sign of poor economic management and failed economic policy? Is the high rate of borrowing justifiable? My name is Kamfisa Manchishi with my co-host Tilianji Mwanda. Thank you Kamfisa. In the studio we are joined by Forum for, Forum for Democracy and Development FDD leader Edith Nawaki herself a former Minister of Finance and a seasoned economist. In your introduction, you say that uh, is, is, is our economy in good hands? The simple answer is no. We have said in the past that uh, the economic policies that are being pursued by this particular government, managed by the Minister of Finance and the Central Bank, especially monetary and uh, fiscal policy, are something of a worry to us. Uh, if you look at the borrowing, it has reached record levels, 4.8 uh, uh, billion in a very, very short space of time. It took uh, our first Republican president 27 years to accumulate $7 billion. It has taken Minister Chikwanda less than 36 months to accumulate $4.8 billion. And you can clearly see the difference. The borrowing in the First Republic was directed at construction of the university, construction of the Kariba North Bank, construction of the Great North Road, construction of Indeni, construction of schools and uh, many facilities such as the University Teaching Hospital. No. We have never said as FDD that borrowing is bad. As a party, we always say that uh, there's no country on earth that has developed from its own resources. Even countries that uh, um, produce oil and produce uh, very, very important mineral resources, they have borrowed at one time or another, but they are borrowing for investment. What is of worry and major concern in our country is that the borrowing is for consumption. I think you recall that uh, about last year, the public servants got 100% increment and there was no money as late as September. And we did warn the government that that kind of approach was going to induce hyperinflation in the economy. But I'm sure their response is a matter of record. What is worrying us is that even the money which was sent to ZESCO, Zambia Railway Systems, which is Zambia Railways, has been collected back to try and support government's uh, uh, expenditure on salaries. I, I try to simplify the language so that all of us can, can understand. And I want you to know that the management of the money which is being borrowed, the, especially the euro bond, is, is also a matter of grave concern because the money is not being placed at central bank. When they borrow the money, they leave this money in commercial banks. For example, they will ask as to which account Zesco is holding. And Zesco doesn't hold their balances with the central bank. They hold the balances with the commercial banks and they will send money immediately to specific activities which are intended, which will never even be uh, undertaken. But that is the money that uh, commercial banks are going to, are now using to buy treasury bills at the central bank. So basically, 
uh, we are paying double as a country. We pay the cost of borrowing from the euro market. Then we pay again to, to pay back for the treasury bills which have been sold to private banks and the banks have bought those TBs with our own money. This is where I have great differences with my elder brother, the current Minister of Finance, because there appears to be no one at the ministry who understands the flow of money and anyone who should be able to tell the government as to how to reduce costs. Ideally, what should happen is that at a close of day, in a banking, on a, in a specific banking day, all the money should be mopped up from the banks, and I'm talking about government money in private banks, should be mopped up and kept at the central bank overnight. But what happens in our system is that this money is left in the hands of private banks, and these banks are using the same money to do what they call interbank lending. So they are using government balances to trade and make profit on it. And the Minister of Finance says, it's okay. If you talk, he says he doesn't want to, under, to listen to us who went to, to this university, who, who were taught by Ben Turok, who were taught by people who seemed to understand what uh, uh, money is. Maybe uh, they have new books, but look, our minister was minister of this country 40 years ago. He's the only one on record in the world who has gone to the same portfolio 50 years later. And I'm sure we all agree that this is not the age and time for this kind of management. We have great difficulties in the way our economy is being managed. Even the investments that is being undertaken, I just came from the Copper Belt. You look at the, the famous Mufrila Ching, Mufrila uh, Kitwe Duo Carriageway. You cry if you see what is going on. There's absolutely nothing going on because people are just excavating, piling up dust, and uh, the so-called Duo Carriageway, we don't know when it will be delivered. And basically what we can see is leakages of public monies through public works. And uh, the quality of work remains to be, leaves a lot to be desired. So these are some of the challenges and uh, we are greatly concerned that our debt is growing and there's absolutely no indication as to how you, our children, will pay off this debt. Because there's no return on any investment that we can see in the next 10 years. This is a time when we need to accept the stark reality that you, our young people, have extra knowledge that we can use to further the interest of this country. And uh, that's the solution number one. Solution number two is that the governor at the central bank is a lawyer. He is best suited for investment banking, not commercial banking. And uh, you will agree with me that uh, the structure of our central bank, we have the governor, we have two deputy governors. One governor for operations, and that position, govern, deputy governor for operations, is intended as a position for supervisory roles for the commercial sector, for commercial banking sector. Unfortunately, that position is currently vacant, and it's been vacant, I think, for the last three months. So the commercial banks do not have a supervisor. The second position is Deputy Governor Administration. It's held by a lady. She's a lawyer and well, as a lawyer I can say that is a very good position for administration. But we certainly need an operative in the role of Deputy Governor Operations. And that role must be a person of competence. So if you don't have that position of a supervisor for the commercial banking sector. They are actually having a free ride. No wonder they are actually using the euro bonds to do interbank lending, to buy treasury bills, and this is what is increasing the money in circulation and causing inflation. And basically, this is the same money they are using to buy dollars when the governor releases money in the system. This money is quickly mopped up, and unfortunately, this money is not even accounted for in our books because 
all these foreign registered but locally operating banks have dollar balances in their capitals which are never counted for as Zambian balances, which is wrong. This is this is exactly what happened, I think, in the early nineteen in the late nineteen ninety eight two thousand. We discovered at the Ministry of Finance that most of these foreign low Zambian registered banks with foreign held headquarters would buy dollars from the local market and send them to their capitals. And these balances were never counted. And when we told them that if they buy dollars from Zambia, when they are doing their balances, they need to show us that these are part of the accounting system for Zambia. We began to see a stability in the exchange rate. We need a debt management and contraction policy. We also need to change the way government operates, uh, or the way parliament operates. I think that they've been undertaking reform, and that reform is meant to make parliament independent. At the moment, parliament is not independent because uh, the funding comes to, from the same Minister of Finance, Everything has to be done, but in places where I'm referring to, and a simple ca case in point is, uh, is Kenya, they, they have what is called the Parliamentary Service Commission. They are funded differently, they hire their own staff, they are, they are independent from the operations of the Minister of Finance. Can you imagine if you are leading parliament and you are, uh, the very next day you see the speaker going to see the Minister of Finance for Parliament to be funded. So there's no independence. And this has been the, the call from the people that can we make Parliament independent. It's not about what they say. He who pays the piper calls the tune. And right now, the Minister of Finance pays Parliament by way of subventions which are not given upfront to the Parliament so that they can make decisions, they can change laws. And one specific suggestion which has been turned down is that parliament should police the debt contraction by government. That has been outrightly thrown out of the proposals from parliament. And yet it's a very, very good uh, step in the right direction which government has refused to undertake. This government has not even talked about it. The pre previous government just turned it down. And their argument was that these MPs, they want to control the executive. I do sympathize with my brothers and sisters in the police force, but what I've discovered is that uh, there's a difference in understanding only what constitutes the Public Order Act. At the top, they understand it the way it's supposed to be done. They know that uh, uh, as politicians, we need to let them know that we are in their precinct so that they can be able to protect us should any violence occur. On the grassroots, the foot soldiers in the police service think, some think, that the Public Order Act was created so that the public can get permission from the police to hold meetings. And we have said, no, that's not the way it was crafted. I think that uh, uh, towards 2006 general elections, there was a lot of outcry on how the Public Order Act was being abused by the ruling party then to, to get some parties not to have public meetings. And as the politicians started to debate together with the police, we agreed that it was necessary to provide a tool for the police to be able to manage public meetings. Just in case uh, FDD was to have a meeting at uh, Unza Radio this hour, and another political party was to have the same meeting at Unza Radio the same hour. What would, uh, what would be the mechanism to, to, to separate these two uh, groups? And we agreed that uh, it was necessary that the police be given a framework with which they could use to regulate the meetings. And therefore, the seven days is not a requirement that you must give the police seven days before your meeting. It is meant so that if there are two or three political parties who want to hold a meeting at the same time, same venue, same hour, you can use the, that law to say, no, today it is going to be FDD, tomorrow is going to be NAREP, the next day it's going to be PF. 
That's all. That was the basis and the logic behind the seven days. It was never meant to be a requirement for permission. You must inform me in, in seven days. However, if a political party doesn't feel that there's any threat, you can have the meeting. Even the police have a right to say, you've given us too short a notice, we are not coming to your venue to protect you. It's only meant to provide protection. We have seen that uh, even within political parties, you can have uh, a national uh, uh, meeting, as we saw in uh, MMD, they were fighting at their headquarters. We have seen some of our sister parties fighting within themselves at their offices. The notice is simply meant so that the police are prepared in the event that even within the political parties you could start a fight. They will be on standby to assist the person, to provide protection to the public. But that protection is for public meetings. What we have been having are private meetings. We hold them at our secretariat to do recruitment and train our people on how they will go for mass mobilization. The meeting at Hindu Hall was in a private premises. Hindu Hall is private. We had paid and we were indoors to, for them to come and lock up our doors, the doors to the Hindu Hall. We felt quite injured and attacked and an affront to the freedom of assembly and movement. But anyway, we resolved it because we realized that among us, the, 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 the young men and women who came, some were obviously intent on causing a, a disruption of public order. And we were surprised that the police could actually engage themselves in an attempt to disrupt public order because they came armed with tear gas canisters and uh, they wanted to stop our meeting because we know we are right. We held our ground. And when we are right, we hold our ground. And um, luckily, they discussed amongst themselves and were able amongst themselves to agree that they were the ones who were trespassing in private premises.